So here we are. The hate speech legislation has been passed in the Scottish Parliament. And let's have a look at it in its final form. Right, before we get on to that, Hamza Yousaf tweeted what was supposed to be a reassuring tweet uh, earlier on today. Uh, he retweeted a tweet from someone basically calling him a C-U-N-T, uh, which was rather unpleasant. But Hamza said this. He said, the beauty of the hate crime bill is that you can say that all day long, not that I'd encourage it, and it would not be a criminal offence under the bill. Offensive, yes, uh, but not criminal, as the bill protects freedom of speech. Right, I'd like to start off by pointing out to Hamza that he doesn't seem to understand how his own bill works. Right, calling someone a C-U-N-T. Would most people describe that as abusive? I mean, I, I certainly would. If someone said, someone was abusive to me, and I said, well, give me your evidence. Why do you say they're abusive? Well, they call me that. I'd say, oh, well, okay, you know, fair enough. That is abusive. And the threshold in Humza's law is threatening or, not and, or abusive. So it would be abusive. Was it intended to stir up hatred? Well, how do you know? If the person had put in front, you know, Paki or Muslim or whatever, then Humza would definitely have been able to uh, get them. But even though it's not mentioned in that tweet, if they could find something else that this Callum had put online somewhere that expressed hostility towards Muslims or people of Pakistani origin, then they would have a good chance of getting them prosecuted for hate speech, for stirring up uh, hatred. So the bill's passed. So let's have a look in a bit more detail at what's in it now. Well, where should we start? Let's start with one of the things that's been taken out from the bill. Because various freedom of speech protections were included in the bill up until a couple of days ago when they were removed. Here's one of them. Protection of freedom of expression with regard to sexual orientation. Behaviour or material is not to be taken to be threatening or abusive solely on the basis that involves or includes discussion or criticism of sexual conduct or practices urging of persons to refrain from or modify sexual conduct or practices. Now, as it was, that was a pretty feeble protection of freedom of speech. I mean, for example, the equivalent English law includes criticism or disagreement with same-sex marriage. The Scottish version, they decided to deliberately miss that out. But in any case, this feeble free speech protection, even this, has now been removed from the bill. Why was it removed? Well, basically, because the Conservatives and the SNP did a backroom deal and decided that they would remove all of these freedom of speech protections. The leadership of the Conservatives and the leadership of the SNP agreed that between them. OK, then it comes to the vote in the Parliament and all the Conservative MSPs votes to have this freedom of speech protection to stay in the bill, even though their party had agreed in a, like in a secret meeting that it would be removed. I mean, they make no sense at all. So who else voted to have this freedom of speech protection removed? Who voted to take this protection away? Well, uh, without comment, I'll just tell you some people who did. Kate Forbes, John Mason, uh, Michelle Ballantyne, leader of the Reform Party, uh, nay Brexit Party. Uh, they all voted against this freedom of speech protection. Now, they could say, oh, well, the way the bill's been made now, we've taken away all the specific protections and just had a general one. Well, you'll see from what's coming next, that's not actually true because religion has been treated differently. So the specific freedom of speech protections have been taken out and they've been replaced by this. Protection of freedom of expression. Uh, behavioural material is not to be taken to be threatening or abusive solely on the basis that it includes or involves Discussion or criticism of matters relating to age, disability, sexual orientation, transgender identity, variations in sex characteristics. OK, so that's uh, discussion or criticism of matters relating to. Then we have a different part. Discussion or criticism relating to or expressions of antipathy, dislike, ridicule or insult towards basically religion, religious beliefs or practices, or the position of not holding religious beliefs, and also proselytizing, urging a person to cease practicing their religion. So let's look at the first one. Discussion or criticisms of matters relating to. Notice what that doesn't cover. It doesn't cover criticisms of people. 
okay, only of ideas. So if a person were to say, I'm not necessarily saying that I would, uh, would say this, but let's say a person were to say trans people are delusional and self-obsessed, okay? I would say that's not covered by the freedom of speech, uh, so-called freedom of speech protection. Uh, even less protected would be someone who said to a particular trans person, I think you are delusional and self-obsessed, for example. So it's only covering abstract discussion, not actually direct interactions with people talking about individuals or about that group of people. So I think that so-called freedom of speech protection is very carefully worded so that it actually doesn't protect that much freedom of speech at all. Now notice antipathy, dislike, ridicule and insult, they're only protected when people uh, express those towards a religion. Now, I actually agree you should be able to express antipathy, dislike, ridicule and insult to, towards any religion. So, uh, so that is good. But why just religion? Why did that happen? I mean, it makes you wonder what's going on behind the scenes here. I mean, is there some sort of close connection between the National Secular Society and someone in the Scottish government or something? I don't know. It just seems odd that they seem to have, have provided so much protection for people critical of religion. So let's imagine how this could play out. Let's say someone said, for example, teenagers are a pain in the neck. Right, you could say that's an expression of uh, insult, dislike, uh, ridicule, antipathy, possibly. But it's not towards religion, it's towards age. So that's not protected under this freedom of speech protection. How about if someone said, I don't like English people or I don't like Polish people. Now you may say that's a stupid thing to say. People say a lot of stupid things that are not crimes, you know, including in the Scottish Parliament. So if someone were to say that, would that be protected? Well, that's antipathy or it's dislike of uh, English, Polish people, whatever. Would that be protected? No, because you can only uh, express antipathy and dislike if it's towards a uh, religion. So if you were to ridicule a man wearing a dress and say, oh, you look ridiculous, that would clearly not be covered by this free speech protection because it's only religion that can be ridiculed. Now notice what was missing. There's one characteristic. You're not even allowed to criticize or discuss matters relating to and that's race, color, nationality, ethnic or national origins. It's not even declared that you're free to discuss or criticize matters relating to. So in other words it seems to be saying that it can be taken to be threatening or abusive solely on the basis that it involves discussion or criticism of matters relating to race or national origin, etc. Now, that seems quite concerning to me. That seems to um, rule that a lot of perfectly valid debate would be in danger of coming under the remit of this legislation. I say, but then you get to religion. It's just open season. It seems fine to be saying anything there. Um, but notice, again, it's not towards the person. It's towards the idea, the religion, the ideology, whatever. So an insult towards a person could be covered by it. So if someone to say, oh, you know, typical Catholic bigot, then that could very clear, well, that's clearly is not covered by this freedom of speech protection. Now, if you're thinking people shouldn't say that, I would say, yes, people shouldn't say that. But uh, the question is whether or not it, you want it to be classed as a hate crime. And this freedom of speech protection seems to indicate that it very clearly would be. So basically, to summarise, these freedom of speech protections that have been added to replace all the others, basically, are pretty useless. They really don't cover very much at all. So overall, what will be the results of the legislation as it's been passed in this form? Well, for a start, there'll be scores of reports to the police. Currently, they're saying, please, please, please report hate crimes to us and report hate incidents to us. You've got lots of organizations saying, please, please, please report to the police anytime you think you've been mistreated or offended or insulted or whatever. So the police are going to be deluged. They're already deluged by them. They're going to get even more. Whereas once before they'd have said, oh, you know, I'd like to report a hate crime. And the police would say, well, it's not really a crime there, but we'll record it as a hate incident. Now the police will be more likely to think, oh, well, we're not quite so sure. And the person reporting it will be a lot more confident. They'll be saying, well, it is, it is, it is. This is hate speech. This is stirring up hatred. You need to do something about it. 
So what will happen? Investigations will be opened up. People will be interviewed, statements taken. From that point, no matter what happens, the person has paid a price. The process is the punishment. There will be some cases where people are prosecuted under this law and it will be an injustice. In the early stages, it will be people who said things that really were ill-considered. They were offensive. I mean, basically, there wouldn't be the sort of things I would say, or I hope you would say, but there'd be the sort of things someone who's maybe uh, not so uh, careful with their wording or someone who's, you know, maybe they are a bit hostile, maybe, you know, they're a bit grumpy or whatever. It will be that sort of person who will be caught by it first. And I think in those cases, prosecution is not the best way of dealing with it. But the main effect will be the chill. People already say, that's hate speech, as though it's some sort of legal category. Well, before too long, when this bill has actually comes into force, it will be a legal uh, category. And people will just use it in the same way. So someone will say something, and someone will reply, that's hate speech. And the person will think, is it? Uh, I don't really think it is. I don't know. What's the law say exactly? Uh, I don't know. They'll just be a bit worried, and they will back off. That will be the end of the conversation. Now, when someone says it to me, they've already said it lots of times. They'll say it lots of times in the future. I tend to think, well, no, it isn't. And I don't care if it is in any case. I'm going to say it regardless. But the vast majority of people won't take either of those lines. And freedom of speech will be further undermined in Scotland. It's already in a pretty sad state, but this will make it even worse. What I'm going to do next is show you some clips from the debate about this legislation just before it was passed. You can judge the standard of debate for yourself. And throughout, you'll hear quite a bit of expressive antipathy towards the one group who absolutely deserve it, as far as the Scottish Parliament are concerned. And that, of course, is men. When I sought to highlight the suffering, discrimination and violence women suffer globally because of their sex, Patrick Harvey agreed with a comment um, that I had displayed, quote, a vicious bit of transphobia and added, quote, I'm sorry to say we can expect more of that when it comes to stage three of the hate crime bill. Now, perhaps we should forgive Patrick Harvey for letting a sense of male entitlement show. So this Labour MSP has been accused by Patrick Harvey of being transphobic, which is, of course, complete rubbish. But you hear how she replies. She said he's displaying his male entitlement. Now, some people think these gender critical feminists like this MSP, that they're somehow the voice of reason in the Scottish Parliament. Don't you believe it? But anyway, in the Scottish Parliament, male entitlement is not the issue. More male emasculation. I mean, will any man ever stand up and push back against the sort of demonization of their sex. I mean, it doesn't even need to be a man who does it. Anyone in the parliament, will they stand up and question this? Well, none of them have done it yet. Women murdered by men going on a rampage it can be upsetting. Well, yes, I think we can agree that is uh, upsetting. Maybe that's uh, quite mild to say as well. But it is never a surprise. Men do these things. We know it. Never a surprise. Eh? That's just typical of men, typical male behaviour. In other words, the no point, no, 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 whatever percent of men who might uh, engage in this sort of behaviour, they represent all men. We can tar all men with that brush. I mean, this is just blatantly demonising men, stirring up prejudice and hostility uh, towards them, with a suggestion that men are rampaging murderers. Right, imagine if a similar comment was made about, say, Muslims or black men. Do you imagine that? Now, uh, they were trying to claim they'd say, oh, but the evidence does show that men commit these crimes. Let's say someone did have evidence that showed that Muslims disproportionately committed similar crimes or black men disproportionately committed criminal, uh, th these sort of crimes. Would that justify that sort of sta uh, statement? Of course it wouldn't. They would be absolutely up in arms. Why are women who understand hate crime more than any other group excluded? Is that true? Are women the victims of so-called hate crime the most? I really don't know. But you can see the oppression arms race mentality coming through. But to clarify what the dispute is here, when the hate crime legislation was proposed, some feminist groups said, we don't want sex in as a characteristic, because that would mean a woman could be prosecuted for a hate crime against a man, but we don't want that. We want a law that's biased, so that only men could be prosecuted for hate crimes against women. And the Scottish government said, 
Yeah, okay, fair enough. Let's do that then. So they appointed a special working group to try and work out how they could come up with this rigged law that can only apply to men and not to women. And now some other feminists are saying, no, this is all wrong because it's resulted in a delay. They would rather have had sex put in or maybe um, just female sex put in at an earlier stage. And this is the controversy. This is what the daggers are out about. Now, she's talking about uh, women being excluded from the protection. I mean, no one's excluded from protection by the law. The sort of crimes that might be committed against a woman or anyone else are already crimes. So she's making it sound like at the moment, you know, it's not illegal to attack women and they're, they're still not going to make it illegal to attack women. But of course it is. We're told that men are manipulative. We have no doubt there'll be manipulative men who will manipulate any piece of legislation in here, including the other protected characteristics identified in this legislation. Manipulative men, eh? Because they might make malicious claims of hate crime. That was an argument against putting sex in as a characteristic under the hate crime legislation, because they thought some men might use it to make malicious complaints about women. Now, would women ever be manipulative and make a malicious complaint against a man? We don't even need to consider that possibility. It's so ridiculous. It doesn't even need to be mentioned in the legislation. But the main issue is that men are manipulative. And men could be manipulative about all of the characteristics, making malicious accusations, apparently. I mean, this is nothing short of female supremacism and male demonization. And again, from the men in the parliament, from anyone in the parliament, is there any objection to it? Any pushback? Not a bit. Instead, you see the men in the parliament, when they want to emphasise their moral credentials, they just say, you know, some women think that. So it's not me that thinks it. Obviously, it wouldn't be that important if it just I thought it. But this is what some women are saying. And then you get the other side of the argument saying, some women's group groups agree with what I'm saying as well. It's like woman is the trump card. Logic and reason, that's not so important. But if you're going to get the woman card in, the women are on your side, then obviously that's the trump card and you're home and dry. This sort of atmosphere is what we're bringing boys up in. This is the ethos of education. This is the atmosphere that girls are being brought up in as well. When girls are being brought up in this sort of uh, atmosphere, I mean, the suggestion that you commit your life uh, to, to spend the rest of your life with a man, that sounds a pretty crazy idea, doesn't it, if this is what men are like? Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. A YouGov poll for UN Women UK published this week found that nearly every young woman, every young woman in the UK has suffered sexual harassment. Almost every young woman has suffered sexual harassment. I thought, well, I'll just look up this poll, YouGov. It'll be there on the internet, there it is. Here we are. Uh, how many women have experienced sexual harassment in their lifetime? In Britain, uh, 52%. Uh, in the last five years, 19%. Can that really be covering all young women? I'm not sure it can. I couldn't actually find any statistics directly uh, relating to what she said. But the other question is, what's classed as sexual harassment that these women are claiming to have been the, uh, the victim of? Uh, well, let's see. Um, commented on your attractiveness directly to you. Uh, that was one form of sexual harassment. Um, looked at your breasts. I mean, okay, that sounds pretty uh, subjective. And then the question could also be asked what people were wearing uh, at the time. How about this one for sexual harassment? Winked at you. Directed a social joke at you. Mm, so maybe place their hand on your lower back. Hmm. I mean, some of the others are clearly sexual harassment. Um, asked you out for a drink. Okay, sexual harassment, asked you out for a drink. Yeah, so that's some of the things they're classifying as sexual harassment. Now, it was interesting as well, this same poll also gave the opinion of women about these different forms of purported sexual harassment. So the one about making a comment about your attractiveness directly to you, 52% of women said they thought that was absolutely fine. 19% uh, didn't agree. Uh, with the others, similarly being winked at or being invited out for a drink, again, most women were saying, that's not sexual harassment. But regardless, it gets lumped in into the statistics and it ends up getting quoted in the Scottish Parliament. Now, finally, she said about young women. So there was one graph that talked about young women, but that was only in the last uh, month. Uh, how many have experienced sexual harassment by their definition, which includes all those things? And 
Uh, the most recent figures, which did come out just this week, uh, showed that 9% of women said they had experienced sexual harassment in the last uh, month uh, once or more. So then basically the statistics she's quoting are just completely wrong. Uh, I became convinced that the scale of the sexist violence women experience at male hands, including the two women a week in the UK killed by men. Again, two women a week killed by men. Uh, I've heard from other sources that that's just not true. But anyway, let's say it was two uh, women a week killed by men, 104 a year. How many murders in the UK? 816. So 104 women killed by men. What about the other 712? That would be men killing men, women killing women, and women killing men. Uh, out of all the murder victims, 75% of them are male. But you see, from this feminist perspective, you forget all the others, and you just focus on the ones where women are the victim and men are the perpetrators, and then you turn it into a gender issue and basically promoting a sort of demonising men message. Over the last few weeks, members from across the chamber have spoken up against the growing inequalities faced by women. Growing inequalities? I mean, that, that's just not true, is it? I mean, our society is becoming progressively more sexist. It just isn't. But one might reasonably anticipate the furore that would follow a male politician such as myself saying, let's disregard that women's group with its distinguished woman leader. It doesn't matter that the groups work with all these talented women, is underway. I want to put in the legislation what I want at this time, regardless of what they might plan. So this is how MSP is commenting on this special working group that's trying to work out how to rig the law in favour of women. And notice his point. It's not that they're right or they're justified or reason is on their side. It's just that they're women with a woman in charge. You know, I'm just a man. Who am I to say? But these are women. Who can really argue with women? And in the Scottish Parliament, who can? If I were to invite half a dozen pals to my home and treat them to a rant of anti-Semitic bilge and they go off and desecrate the nearest synagogue, of course I should be liable for a hate crime. Of course I should. So we're over to the Conservatives now. But this argument is just not right. This bill does not make people liable for other people's actions. If you have people around your house or make comments online, and let's say you criticise Islam or trans people or whatever, and as a result someone commits a crime, does that mean that's your fault? That you've committed a crime too? Definitely not. Definitely not. I mean, that's a pretty serious mistake to make from someone who's been at the heart of developing this legislation. People cannot be held responsible for the actions of others. Imagine that I have a family gathering, a Friday night supper, at which my unreconstructed and somewhat embarrassing elderly uncle makes disparaging remarks about a same-sex couple. Again from the Conservatives, notice this characterisation of the person who seems to disapprove of homosexuality in some way. They're elderly, unreconstructed and embarrassing. That says it all about the Conservative Party, doesn't it? Hamza Yousaf also addressed the same point and he said we've all got uh, elderly, unreconstructed, embarrassing uncles like that. Now, Hamza Yousaf, yes, I'm sure you have, because probably the substantial majority of the Muslim community from which you come would share the sort of views that the previous MSP was referring to. Members may well remember the so-called Punish a Muslim Day in 2018. I think, if I remember correctly, Anna Sauer uh, raised the issue uh, in the chamber with the First Minister. Uh, leaflets were distributed in schools at workplaces, they were put through the doors of mosques, all to threaten an entire community. People were to be quote unquote awarded points for pulling off the hijab of a Muslim woman or to pull the beard of a Muslim man. Now Hamza trots out this case. This leaflet would obviously be an example of incitement to commit a crime. In other words, it would already be illegal. So in order to justify a new law, he has to resort to a case of something which is already illegal. Occur, it has the potential for life-threatening implications for members of the targeted group if the incitement of acts of violence through threatening or abusive behaviour intended to stir up hatred are acted upon. So again, in order to justify the new law, we're given an example of something that would already be illegal. I mean, Homsa included in his description there, incitement. 
but no one picked up on it in the Parliament. If a person stirs up hatred in others, uh, and those others attack Catholics, Protestants, Sikhs, etc., as a result of hatred being stirred up in them, it should not matter at all where the hatred was stirred up. The effect is very much the same. Groups have been singled out for hatred, and they be, have been attacked for who uh, they are. I now, we've got the same problem here as we had with the Conservative MSP. This idea that you're responsible for the consequence, that if you say something and subsequently someone else commits a crime, possibly as a result of it, then that justifies you being prosecuted. That's just not right. That can't possibly be fair. I mean, one of the problems with it is you could end up with a sort of forced flag incidents. The one person says something, then someone uh, like makes some sort of attack on the person just in order to get the speaker in trouble. Or alternatively, and more likely, someone says something and then someone reports that they've been attacked or victimised or abused or whatever as a result of it, just in order to get the person into trouble. And if your local family of neo-Nazis are getting together to discuss um, their, their vile deeds, um, then I think the location is irrelevant. Well, if they're talking about vile deeds, those deeds will be illegal, so the hate speech legislation is irrelevant. Uh, on one side of the le leaflet, there was a, a, an image of a mannequin being hanged. On the other side, the leaflet said the only debate about homosexuality was how to carry out the execution and called for the death penalty. Now, that was clearly threatening and intended to, to, to stir up hatred. Again here, this is a clear case of incitement to violence, so it's already illegal. We've already seen attempts to secure explicit legal protection in this bill for practices like dead naming and misgendering. While it may be possible for such expressions to be made in ways which do not meet the tests of this offence, nobody should be in any doubt that they very frequently form the basis of abuse directed against trans people in our society. So now we get to Patrick Harvey himself. There was a free speech protection proposed in the earlier stages that said it wouldn't be uh, stirring up hatred to call a transgender person by their old name or to call them he when they wanted to be called she. Uh, but Patrick Harvey got his way because the Conservative Party agreed to take away this free speech protection. But we should also be clear about the deeper threat. There are anti-trans campaigners openly working with religious far-right organisations from the US, which in turn are open about their strategic goal of using trans equality as a wedge issue to fragment the equalities movement. At least one such organisation is already active in Scotland and has been quoted approvingly by members of this parliament. Let's not kid ourselves that if they succeed in opposing trans people's equality and human rights, that they will be satisfied with that. Their next target may be sex education, or equality in family law, or HIV drugs on the NHS, or abortion rights. You don't need to look far to find anti-trans activists arguing against all of these things. Yes, Patrick, that's us, apart from the American funding. Uh, yes, we're opposed to, well, not sex education in general, but certainly the sex education uh, of the type that you would want. Uh, against HIV drugs? Well, not in general. I mean, there are question marks about the ones that are given uh, to men who uh, allegedly find it difficult to use a condom. I'm not sure if that's a, a good use of NHS resources. That's not a family party policy. Um, views about family structure? Very definitely opposing abortion? Absolutely so Patrick Harvey spills off this list of you know, evils, basically, in his eyes, and it goes completely unchallenged. So when this bill comes into force, we're going to get it in the Scottish Family Party, left, right and centre. That's hate speech, that's hate speech. And the standard response will probably be, uh, the number you want is 999. You phone the police and see what happens. If the police come knocking at the door one day, wanting to talk about an incident or to investigate an incident, Get the phone on record and we'll just take it from there. Watch this space. Just to summarise the hate speech legislation saga, who have been the main players? Well, we've had Hamza Yousaf, whose main objective seems to have been to enable him to get people who are mean to him on Twitter. Then we've got the SNP, who are obsessed with identity politics, uh, currying favour with selected identity groups and suppressing dissent, because they're the only ones 
who are actually good people. That's what they uh, believe. Now, the Labour Party, uh, same sort of view. Only people on their wavelength are really good people. Lib Dems, uh, more of the same, uh, at least as bad as the SNP in that regard. I mean, the Greens, even worse. As far as the Greens are concerned, there are two sorts of people in the world. There's people who agree with Patrick Harvey. And on the other hand, there's homophobic, transphobic, sexist, racist bigots who deserve to be locked up. I mean, that's not far off the view of the Green Party. And then we get to the real culprits of why we're in this mess. That's the Conservatives. I mean, their routine modus operandi is to be giving ground. They're always engaged in a rearguard action, constant retreat. Sometimes you get the impression that they're temporarily standing and fighting, but then they capitulate. Then while they're in the process of capitulating, they try to pretend that they're really fighting. I mean, really, at least half of the Lib Dems, sorry, at least half of the Conservatives are really Lib Dems in disguise. The handful in the Conservative Party who are actually socially conservative, well, Ruth Davidson and Douglas Ross are in the process of weeding them out as we speak. If you're someone with genuinely conservative views, then you might well have found yourself tumbling down the regional lists and your chance of becoming an MSP or remaining an MSP uh, might seem quite remote now. But what I'd say, I sort of have sympathy for people in that situation, but on the other hand, I say, you joined the Conservative Party. What did you expect? So the main conclusion is what's missing. I mean, what's missing in all these debates is the Scottish Family Party. If we had a few MSPs, it's not the couple of votes that would matter. It would be the shaking up of these debates because we would take a principled stand on issue after issue. And if you want to support us in that project, do join the Scottish Family Party. There's a link below. And also our 2021 election crowdfunder is currently open and we'd really appreciate your donations to that. Again, the link is below. Thanks for watching.